Welcome everyone, and thanks for attending my second and Maverick's fifth webinar presentation. We expect to continue providing monthly webinars going forward that will primarily focus on the engineering, inspection, and supporting of non-metallic piping and equipment. That's what we do best. I'll answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of this presentation, but feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. That way none get forgotten. Our engineering manager, Daryl McCulloch, will be gathering the questions you submit during the webinar so we can get to as many of them as possible at the end. First, I want to give you a brief reminder of how to work the GoToWebinar software we use for these presentations. The software allows you to ask questions by typing them into the questions panel at any time during the presentation. To activate the questions panel, click on the arrow on the left side of the questions tab. This will open an area below the tab where you can type your question. When you've typed your question and you're ready, press the send privately button. This will let you ask your question while it's fresh in your mind and allow us to gather everyone's questions for the end so we can combine similar questions and hopefully get to as many of them as possible. We won't use your name when responding to your questions unless you specifically ask us to. Let me quickly introduce myself. I am Tom Haber and I lead some of the best non-metallic equipment inspectors in the world. Between project coordination, field service projects, and performing numerous shop and job site inspections, I've been involved with the FRP industry for almost 30 years. My experience includes most aspects of non-metallic shop manufacturing, field manufacturing, and QA inspections. I've supervised numerous field installations of large FRP projects, including power plant chimney liner stacks, flue gas desulfurization ductwork, chemical process piping, along with storage and pressure vessels galore. During this time, I've had the opportunity to witness several hundred positive and negative pressure tests and acoustic emission tests, along with performing many, many hours of ultrasonic testing on equipment. I remain the current chairman of the American Welding Society's G1 Committee for Thermoplastics, and I'm a member of the AWS subcommittees on plastic welding qualifications and hot gas welding and extrusion welding. I'm also the current chair for the subgroup for fabrication and examination for the ASME non-metallic pressure piping systems NM2 piping standard, which was just uh, released in 2018. And I'm a member of the ASME RTP1 standard subcommittee for materials and quality assurance. Finally, I'm an ASNT certified inspector in the VT method. I know all these credentials have to seem impressive to you, but hopefully they just show you that I'm an active participant in the non-metallic codes and compliance world, and I used to sleep in a lot of hotels. All right, what are we hoping to explain today? I'm hoping to give you a basic understanding of some of the things we look for during shop inspections and why we look at those places primarily. It takes a uniquely qualified person to perform shop inspections of non-metallic equipment due to the variety of manufacturing methods that are employed in producing this equipment. Keep in mind too, that an FRP fabricator performs the equivalent roles of a metal equipment producer, except that the fa FRP fabricator first needs to produce the items to be assembled from the raw materials. The FRP vendor actually has to perform the roles of the foundry, the component producer, and the assembler of the components. Proper FRP shop fabrication inspections will include verifications during all of those production stages. The important things I hope you take away from this presentation include the things that you should consider prior to your arrival at the fabricator. So the importance of the inspection and testing plan, some pre-production items to be reviewed during your initial inspection visit, important fabrication steps that you should try to witness during the equipment's production, laminate and equipment proof testing expectations, some critical areas to review after the testing, and what documentation of the QC verifications and the in-process inspections that are actually occurring from the fabricator. And now, away we go to the land of danger. 
or danger, as my Australian friends say. I've been learning how to speak Australian during my COVID time. Enough frivolity, and on to the meat of the presentation. Prior to any inspection, you should make sure you have the latest approved fabrication drawings and project specifications. That's the Bible for what you're looking for when you go witness this equipment. Also from these documents, you should be able to determine any required ASME, ASTM, or other standards that are listed as reference and you might need for that inspection. You don't always need those standards with you, but you need them readily available so that you can gain access to them. Um, sometimes you just need to check something and you need to verify it, that's why. It's important to remember that the inspection criteria is based on an agreement between the purchaser and the equipment's vendor. The inspector needs to know what level of inspection they're performing though. Your purchase order to the equipment vendor should have defined your fabrication quality expectations for the equipment. The inspection and testing plan is a critical document for any inspector and it should be agreed to by both the purchaser and the equipment's fabricator during the project's design phase. A properly executed ITP provides the owner's expectations for the fabricator's QC inspections during the production of the equipment, and it sets the hold points for the fabricator to adhere to. Some of the critical points in the manufacturing process to consider inspecting are shown on this slide. But first and foremost, you want to verify that the fabrication drawings that you're using for inspection are approved for fabrication and they've been released to the shop floor. Prior to your arrival, review the design drawings and the ITP and any reference specifications that you need. And take into consideration what phase of fabrication the vendor should be at prior to your arrival so that you have a good idea of what you should be looking at during that particular inspection. This will allow you to properly prepare for the inspection. During most inspections, we carry a variety of tools with us, like environmental gauges, thickness gauges, tape measures, bar call impressors, and Allen wrenches. Ask me why we carry Allen wrenches if you're paying attention, and if you haven't already heard about using them. With some forethought, about what you should expect to see during the inspection, you can be sure that you have the right inspection tools for that phase of the fabrication. For instance, if you're gonna inspect six inch diameter pipe and no spool is longer than 10 feet, you probably don't need a 100 foot tape measure in your inspection bag for that trip. The fabricator should be required to perform certain tasks to ensure the fabrication quality, but you need to be able to confirm those results using your own equipment. During your first inspection visit to the fabrication facility, you need to look to see if the fabricator is keeping all their reinforcement materials in a clean, dry location. Are the cut reinforced materials being packaged and labeled for their future assembly use? Is the bulk resin being stored in a climate controlled location? Is job specific resin being tracked to the production floor and directly into the produced laminates? Are all the raw material lot numbers being tracked from their certificate of analysis to the finished parts produced? That's your question. Maintaining the traceability of, pro of the project's engineering documents is critical when dealing with drawing changes that will affect the fabrication. Pay attention to how the drawings and other production documents are being distributed and maintained on the shop floor. Does the fabricator remove all the outdated drawing revisions from the production floor? Are they tracking each drawing that's released? Are there multiple sets of approved fabrication drawings in use on the fabrication floor? Sometimes there may be because different departments may need copies of the drawings. Is each drawing set location clearly documented though for replacement with the future revision? Are all the required QC checks being noted on the production drawings and the production traveler documents? 
or are they hoping to catch up their paperwork after the job's finished? Are any production notes from the previous drawing revisions being transferred to the new drawings before they're released? Or are the fabrication changes simply being tracked by a paper note taped to the side of the equipment? Some other items I look for initially. Is the fabricator, is the fabrication areas relatively clean, are they? How are the finished but not yet assembled components being stored? How are production molds being stored? Do the production workers use safe practices during normal fabrication operations? You have to pay attention to these things because you're gonna be the inspector in this shop and your safety is first and foremost your responsibility. So you need to pay attention because this won't be a situation that you're used to in this fabricator's facility. Do the employees use the safety equipment that they're being given? Are the tools and machinery being used serviced regularly and in good working condition? Finally, I notice how the shop cuts holes. Do they use a water jet machine to cut a hole, a hole saw, or a saber saw? or hammer and a chisel. Clean hole penetrations to minimize installation gaps require good tooling. Good tooling is a point that typically separates fabricators. A primary goal of your first fabrication inspection visit should be to confirm the produced quality of the corrosion barrier laminates of all the equipment's major components. The corrosion barrier is the primary leak and corrosion resistant portion of your FRP equipment. And a poorly constructed corrosion barrier will cause a premature failure of your equipment. Fiberglass equipment is produced and purchased because it is corrosion resistant. Rarely because it's light, but most of you probably don't do it for that reason. So you need that corrosion resistance that's inherent in the, cor in the corrosion barrier laminates to be good and sound. That's why that inspection point is so critical. You also need to understand the different application methods of an equipment's corrosion barrier to verify that the method of construction you specified for your equipment was actually used to produce those laminates. For instance, if you wanted a corrosion barrier that was produced using rolled good reinforcement material with gap, with overlaps, and make sure you had exactly the right thicknesses, and not using mechanically applied chop strands by hand, then you should be able to verify that's what you received. There are no current inspection tools other than your eyes, which can effectively find defects in a corrosion barrier laminate. There are no magic tools yet. Assuming you have a set, assuming you have set your inspection requirements in the ITP, the inspector will have a set of allowable limits for defects to be accepted or rejected. You'll want to typically look for dry spots, entrapped air, foreign inclusions, areas of excessive heat stress from the curing of the resin, surface pitting, and maybe some wrinkles from the interior surfaces. Many of these defects may be allowable. The inspector's job is to report his findings. Any issues identified should then be resolved through the use of a nonconformance report, or NCR, written by the fabricator to provide a dispensation for the fabricated item. Typically, some level of defect is allowable depending on its placement within the laminate's overall depth. ASTM D2563 does have a level one quality that, when it's invoked, allows absolutely no defects within the laminate, none of any type, period. Now, I would never tell someone not to require an ASTM D2563 level one laminate if they felt their service required that level of quality. I would only tell them to be prepared to deal with numerous NCRs requesting deviations. All the other quality requirements allow some level of defect, depending on where it's at. Closer to the service, on the innermost surfaces, the requirements are typically more stringent than the requirements for the defects that are found deeper in the structural layers. Your inspection 
needs to follow whatever level of inspection criteria has been set in the equipment's purchasing documents. It's a sad day for the inspector when there are no inspection criteria because then he becomes a reporter of every defect classifiable. And I can tell you those reports are long and painful to write. Local thickness verifications can be obtained using ultrasonic testing devices. UT readings through fiberglass can be tricky due to the varying sound velocities being required for different laminate types. Resin-rich laminates have a much different sound dampening character characteristic and different sound velocity requirements than do glass-rich structural laminates. The improper use of these UT variables will cause poor values to be returned. The correct use of UT testing provides reliable, repeatable data on the laminate. The entire value of the laminate sound and dampening data from UT testing is only now starting to be studied. Some of the other inspection items we typically look for include reviewing how the primary overlay welds are being cut and packaged. Are the assembly weld reinforcement layers being cut on a clean table or on the floor? All the production records should be current for the items produced and the QC sign-offs on those sheets should be complete or in process. All of the component inspections should be performed prior to any assembly starting. Equipment tops and bottoms, any piping enclosures, all the flange nozzles and other miscellaneous components should be inspected separately, whether they are complete or still in process during your visits. Work to locate every component item and confirm its correctness, regardless of its stage of fabrication. The equipment's assembly may be started. This is going to eliminate your opportunity to confirm laminate thicknesses at cut edges. That's why you need to endeavor to make every check you can during every visit. During your component inspections, review the fabrication methods being used. Occasionally, even the best molds can produce components that don't meet the project's quality requirements. The lower pictures in this slide show the fabrication project process of a large dome end for a pressure vessel being fabricated. The stands supporting the mold, where you see the, the red highlights, put it in a better position for the workers, but they also cause the turnout of the reinforcement layers where the pipe stands were. Once the dome component was cleaned, cut for assembly, and the end viewed, the end showed the issue with the laminate that you see on the right-hand bottom picture, and the part was rejected for use on the project. Any in-process parts should be witnessed to confirm the proper FRP fabrication steps are being taken. Sometimes you have to look underneath also. Contact molded laminates, hand applied laminates, have a much different appearance than filament wound laminates do. Pultruded and compression molded fittings have another unique appearance. Know what laminate you're expecting to inspect. And if needed, refresh yourself with the unique requirements of that laminate type. Vacuum infused laminates will typically have a much higher glass content than a contact molded laminate that's inherent in their fabrication method. If you inspect the laminate and find that it meets the thickness requirements shown in the drawings, you might be satisfied to move on and let the fabricator buy you an early lunch. But if you notice that the laminate type they built was a contact molded construction when the design drawing showed you a filament wound laminate was required, then your thickness measurement is incorrect for that laminate type. If a laminate is shown to have been filament wound, you should confirm the wind angle of the applied reinforcement strands to make sure that the wind angle matches what's shown on the design drawings. Remember also that flange thicknesses should always be measured through the bolt holes whenever possible.
All applied laminate should be free of large entrapped air bubbles, even in the most difficult transition areas like T's or Y's. You should confirm the cure of the resin within the applied laminates through bark all hardness testing, which you can compare to the resin manufacturer's recommended hardness expectations shown in their product data sheets. The use of certain reinforcement layers such as synthetic veils, carbon veils, and certain resin additives like graphite may lower your overall laminate hardness readings. In these cases, you need to consult the resin manufacturer for their minimum acceptable laminate hardness recommendations if you have any concerns. Acetone sensitivity testing you see uh, on the right hand top right hand picture can provide confidence that the laminate surface is properly cured. This test is performed by adding a few drops of clean acetone to a finished laminate surface and then rubbing the acetone until it evaporates. If the laminate surface becomes sticky or tacky then the laminate may not be well cured. It's important to follow up on the issues noted in any previous NCRs that are unresolved during your follow-up inspection visits. Remember that dome end with the laminate issue from the earlier in the presentation? Rarely, a component that's been rejected for use is not removed and ends up in assembly by mistake. Mistakes happen in every part of life. I make no accusations, but through timely fabrication inspections, you can give yourself added confidence that the agreed component's NCR disposition has actually been followed. NCRs are typically initiated by the fabricator to obtain direction on a part that has a deficiency, minor or major. Rarely, a third-party inspector can initiate an NCR for their customer. The disposition of an item and that NCR is typically recommended by the fabricator's engineering department, but it should also have the customer's approval. The NCR's approval and the documentation of the repair should be included with the final engineering package submitted by the fabricator. Assembly gaps in equipment cause voids. We talked earlier about how to cut hole penetrations cleanly and how that separates many fabricators. And if you look at some of the pictures in this slide, you'll see the different levels of assembly quality. These voids can be filled with putty to provide a smooth laminating surface, but the, pro the putty provides no strength to the overlay to compensate for the gap. And excessive gaps may require engineering involvement to possibly resize the required laminates to account for the gap. Gap tolerances are found in most major standards. The assembly inspections are also a good time to confirm that the shop's environmental conditions are being audited and that you confirm them with your own readings. Any in-process laminates can be checked to gauge peak exotherm temperatures while they're curing. And if you can, find a few minutes to review the fabricator's primary QC equipment calibrations. I don't often leave dates on my pictures because we try to separate them from the uh, picture. But on the bottom left-hand picture, I wanted to see that the picture was taken in 2018 and the fabricator's bar call cal certified calibration was from 2013. There's no hard and fast rules on how often you should calibrate, but I can guarantee you that that instrument was not calibrated when I used it. Thus, I had my own, and that's how we knew. The assembly phase will provide many opportunities to confirm the dimensions and verify the installation requirements of the flange nozzles and the primary components. All dimensions should be confirmed prior to secondary overlay laminates place being placed. To avoid the necessary removal of the laminates if there's something wrong. All dimensions should be signed off by the equipment fabricators QC department, but the customer's inspector should also spot check dimensions and confirm any critical dimensions noted. The proper placement of secondary overlay bonds should be confirmed during each assembly visit. 
each laminate type from the corrosion barrier seal to the structural reinforcement layers, including the reinforcement pad overlays, should be verified to contain the required re reinforcement layers for the thickness, the required overall width of the laminate, and that they're properly placed onto the equipment as shown in the approved fabrication drawings. Usually, laminates are to be centered on a joint. Occasionally, laminates are serving two purposes, like an external joint on a elevated vessel. You may also reinforce the knuckle, the lower knuckle area, with that same laminate, which may cause it to be placed off center. So measuring the laminate placement location is important during your inspections. In the lower center photo, a half moon shaped tailing lug for the lifting is shown being applied onto a vessel. The initially fabricated perpendicular plate section was measured to be correct at one inches in total thickness and it had been cut, cut correctly to match the detail shown in the fabrication drawings. The starter plate can be seen as the greenish section of this ludge projecting off of the vessel. The laminates applied to, the, to attach this tailing lug are the white laminates butting up to those plate edges and the surface veil to cover the laminate. Those, laminate. those attachment laminates are installed incorrectly though. The fabrication drawing showed the laminate should have continued up the tailing lug surface and bonded on to a thinner one quarter inch starter plate and then be trimmed. This mistake could have resulted in an employee injury during lifting or damaged equipment. During the final fabrication inspection prior to the testing, you should confirm that all the production records are correct for the items that are produced. Inspect all of the equipment's secondary overlay bonds to confirm they're acceptable and meet the project's requirements for quality. You want to verify that all previously noted NCRs have been implemented and confirm their compliance. Confirm that all the QC documents are current or correct and not or correct and correct or that at a minimum, the records are being gathered and are ready for inserting into the final documentation package. Confirm that all miscellaneous items have been installed like baffles and nozzles. You should confirm that any required testing stands, blind flanges and test pumps are being prepared and have current calibration dates. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to witness a hydrostatic test and found out that the fabricator's pump wouldn't work or that they didn't have a six inch blind flange they needed, or that the bolts had come in, but they came in as studs and not bolts, so they don't have enough nuts. Do yourself and your customer a favor and confirm that everything that's necessary is prepared prior to the testing. Finally, confirm that all the project's outside purchases, such as the bolting hardware to be submitted with the equipment and gaskets or anything else has been procured and is ready for shipment. There are a variety of methods used to post-cure FRP parts. The most effective post-cure method is for the equipment to be fully enclosed in an oven with constantly moving heat inside the oven. This method ensures a full and complete post-cure of the equipment, not just the internal corrosion barrier laminates. The use of a forced heater, like a kerosene heater blowing into the open end of an equipment to post-cure the laminates, provides varying levels of post-cure to the internal laminates, depending on the heat zone they're in from any air movement. This method provides very little post-cure to the external laminates, however. And the use of heat guns or small local heaters to post-cure laminates should not be accepted. Proof testing of the assembled equipment is recommended to ensure that the design information actually resulted in a piece of equipment that meets your project's requirements. Positive and negative pressure testing is common with FRP equipment. However, air testing is not recommended except for special occasions. The use of a trained non-metallic acoustic emission inspection company can also provide you with some initial baseline data on your equipment and additional confidence in the structural ability of your FRP equipment. 
You should also remember to take the time to confirm any laminate proof testing results that are complete, meet or exceed the design values that were used in the, to design the equipment. Basically, you just want to confirm that the proof test values that are returned exceed the design values so that you know you have a sound vessel or piece of equipment. It is very important to perform a detailed inspection of any equipment that's been proof tested. Rarely, the testing will cause damage to the equipment. Pay particular attention to sharp transition areas like flange nozzles, vessel knuckle areas. Damages can be caused by poorly, la poorly bonded laminates, or they might indicate a much more significant structural design concern. Any damages noted to the equipment after proof testing should be reviewed by the fabricator's design engineer, and they should also be brought to the attention of the purchaser. As I mentioned earlier, flange hub cracking after testing can indicate there were bigger issues with the equipment. Other times it simply indicates a flange that was poorly fabricated. I don't mean to minimize the concerns you should have from finding poorly fabricated flanges being used in the fabrication of your equipment. But if the design is wrong, then every laminate applied will need to be reviewed for adequacy and your delivery date probably just became a moving target. Flange hub, hub cracking is often a significant issue because the thin, fine exterior crack that you see visible in the left-hand picture from your external inspection, which is all you'll have at the time, may be a significant structural issue. Inspectors may note the fine surface crack, surface in parentheses, but not understand the possible significance of that crack. Allowing a piece of equipment back into service only to only lead to a failure in the future. Treat every flange hub crack like it's critical until the fabricator makes you comfortable that they understand the reasons for the damage. If you don't provide the equipment vendor with your quality expectations prior to them beginning the work, you don't have any way to enforce your quality expectations. All applied laminates should be free of large entrapped air. You should confirm the cure of the resin within the applied laminates through bark all hardness testing. Any other project quality data for your inspections can be picked up from the drawings or your applied standards typically. The final pigmented gel coat should only be applied to the equipment after all the inspections are completed. We're often asked why we request no pigmented laminates to be applied until after the final inspection is complete. And the reason is that clear resin laminates can be inspected for damages relatively easily. Delaminations and cracking are fairly easy to notice when there's no pigment in the laminate. But inspecting pigmented laminates is much more difficult and requires a much more experienced inspector. With pigment and laminates, you're primarily looking for discontinuities within the laminate. And without some FRP inspection knowledge, it's very difficult to know the critical areas to look at for these discontinuities. It is always our recommendation that you ask your equipment vendors to not paint the final color onto your equipment until after all testing and the post-testing inspection is complete. All in-process fabrication changes should be noted on the final drawings as, as, as built changes. The QC data book should be complete, including the material certificates of analysis, all QC checks performed, all component QC data, all assembly verification data, a form showing successful proof testing, and a copy of the equipment's nameplate. It's a good idea to have the fabricator note the actual torque values used to seal the flanges for testing on the as-built drawings. This provides future purchaser employees with key information regarding the vessel's flanges. It is critical to confirm that there are no open remaining NCR documents against the equipment prior to shipment. All NCR documents should be resolved prior to the equipment being given the, re the release to ship.
ask for the shipping and transportation done as you expect. If you plan to store this equipment at your site and you don't plan on just laying it in a muddy field, ask for proper dunnage so that you can have a place to rest that vessel correctly before it's placed into service. The service life of your FRP equipment depends on a lot of factors along its history, many of which you won't have any control over. However, initially getting the correct FRP equipment installed that will achieve your ex expected service life is up to you. With proper initial fabrication inspections though, you can ensure that your FRP equipment's critical engineering and design requirements actually got implemented into the fabrication of that new equipment. The piece of equipment you see in the pictures on your screen is 30 years old now. Um, it is used to store chlorine dioxide. It is a large tank, as you can see. It has been relined a couple of times. However, properly designed and installed equipment can store hazardous chemicals for 30 years. Now we've come to the questions and answers portion of the webinar. Daryl, are there any long questions from the audience you can start me off with so I can get a drink of water? Sure, yeah, we have several questions here. The first one's going to be short, but that's because you prompted this question. So we had several biters on this. Why do you carry Allen wrenches? <laughs> Good. Somebody was paying attention. So if uh, you're trying to measure the gaps of something and it's not easy to get to it, it's a small pipe or a difficult location, and you can't get your hand in there to measure exactly how far this gap is, you can use an Allen wrench. They come in different sizes, obviously, and using those Allen wrenches, you can reach back and see which one drops into the gap until you find which one doesn't, and then you know the basic size of your gap, even if you can't see it. Ta-da! Oh, good to know. Yes, I'm not that smart. Somebody else taught me that. So we have a couple questions here on kind of specs and inspection level. So I'll read them and maybe there'll be some follow-up questions here. Okay. So for, let's say a non-RTP1 tank, um, not specified to be RTP1 um, because there's maybe low risk application. If they want to specify a minimum acceptable standard, which one would you recommend? ASTM D2563, C582, is there a reason not to use RTP-1 or NM-2? Uh, no, I would say there's no reason not to use RTP-1 or NM-2. In my opinion, perhaps because I sit on both of those committees, uh, those standards I know are living, breathing, active documents. I know if there's changes to standards, they're going to be made there. So I know those documents to be the most current. Um, ASTM standards can go, I think, seven years without a revision. Sometimes they do, and sometimes you'll see an ASTM that's been recertified for use in 2018 from the 2002 version. So those are good standards also, and they have good information in them. Uh, but I would stick with the more active standards if it was me. Okay. Follow up on that is I, what are my options if I already have a vessel being built, but I have no inspection criteria or level defined? Uh, your best option is to probably find a good mediator um, who can try to resolve what issues you're going to have with what the fabricator is expecting to provide. Uh, the, in, the fabricator in their defense has probably defined in their you know, quotation what they're expecting to produce. If that doesn't match what you expected, or if you didn't have any expectations um, in your purchase documents, you're either bound to what they put in their quote, or you end up with men named Esquire speaking to each other, trying to decide that, that point. It's much better to be upfront um, with your requirements, even if it's not in the production phase, if it's still in the design phase, because then when you set your ITP, this is many times where this point comes about, is when a end user tries to send an ITP to a purchaser, to a uh, fabricator, I'm sorry, and the fabricator says, no, we didn't agree to this. 
And then it's quite a bit of back and forth as you try to come to terms on inspection criteria after the fact. Sure. So a follow up to that one, now that you mentioned ITPs, we have a question that says some fabricators complain or resist accepting ITPs for the project because they create a nuisance and they have their own in-house QA procedures. Their stated position sometimes goes like this. We have our own standard QA procedures based on RTP1 requirements. Adding your ITP does not add any value. What's your opinion to deal with this situation? <laughs> when I was a fabricator, I said those things also. <clears throat> Fabricators know what they're doing um, when they do the same things over and over. If you ask them to do something different, that does create a little disharmony in their shop environment. Typically shops that have solid QA, QC programs who have very good QA, QC inspectors are able to make changes to what they typically do without causing any difficulty. The most important point, honestly, of the ITP is probably setting the end user's hold points that they want to see. If you want to have a pre-inspection visit before any fabrication is complete, then set a hold point at the design phase. And no fabrication can begin until the design phase is complete. That way you know nobody's being asked to fabricate anything early. And then also the testing and the final inspection are the two probably most critical things to witness. Beyond that, everything else goes to what your budget will allow and what your risk level um, will let you take. Okay. Transition a little bit to defects here. We have a question about how do you decide whether defects are worth repairing? For example, a small out-of-spec air bubble that requires grinding away uh, the corrosion barrier and replacing with a secondary laminate. How do you decide what's worth repairing or not? Each case, like each piece of fiberglass equipment, is unique and that's why you have to have a non-metallic subject matter expert, honestly. There are many occasions when it's better to leave a closed corrosion barrier and not grind out damage that's deep because then you have a secondary bond in the corrosion barrier as opposed to a completely closed corrosion barrier. So NC, every NCR does not require uh, a part to be rejected, thrown away and rebuilt. Sometimes an NCR's disposition is accept as is and allow that bubble to stay in there. Now, if you're involved in a pressure vessel that has high temperature acid and many other, you know, sort of, you know, uh, issues going on with that vessel, design conditions that make it critical. You might not be able to accept that um, damage in the uh, that air in the overlay laminate or in any laminate because it can cause bigger delaminations in the future. So there are no cookie cutter answers to whether to leave it or not. Each position, honestly, is dependent on what it looks like. Okay, you touched on this, um, but I just want to ask it again since somebody asked it. Um, I guess sure. what can happen if bubbles or pits or other defects are left alone? What are some of the um, possibilities of what can happen in service? Sure. A bubble is basically a delamination. It's a place where there's laminate above and below, but there's nothing in between, obviously. <clears throat> so that's that's a pocket of air. It can collect liquids if there's permeability of the laminate with the uh, chemicals being stored. So you can end up with bubbles that contain uh, liquids. Also, any bubble like that can expand, um, whether you're going to be in hot service or not. They can expand as they go through service, you know, just from the pressure in the vessel, from the storage and things like that. So air is a defect that needs to be removed unless it will cause additional damage to the laminate. Any out-of-spec air should be reviewed and checked to confirm whether or not it's acceptable because bigger damages can occur later on, bigger blisters, but they won't happen until further down the road. So the purchaser won't know that until it's too late to have a vessel repaired or equipment. Okay. Testing. Do you recommend acoustic emission testing on every vessel or what testing do you recommend? Uh, it's difficult to recommend acoustic emission testing on every vessel um, for 
I see a certain number of vessels, and typically the vessels I see are critical vessels. They're going to store acids and bases and nasty things like that. But fiberglass is also used to store emergency water or salt water. So in those cases, the you know the requirements may be a little bit different. I don't know that there's any you know again there's any sound guidance one way or the other just has to be. Okay, we have one maybe two more questions here. Okay. Um, if I have a small budget, which visit would you say is the most important? Final. Final at least gives you the opportunity to confirm that all the dimensional requirements of your of your equipment are done. Um, it at least gives you the opportunity to check that all the flanges were installed, that all the tray levels were installed, or whatever else you've got going on. Um, it hopefully is after the testing. Hopefully the testing has been completed and correct. And um, hopefully your inspection is before the pigment is applied. Because otherwise, if, if all you do is a final inspection after all the pigment is applied and the vessel is ready to ship, the best you can do is the dimensional qualities of the vessel and some overall quality requirements. But you're severely limited in knowing what's inside. Okay. So the last question here, I want to make sure I understand it correctly. The original question was, was the damaged cap shown in the presentation repairable? And specifically, no. they're talking about the large vessel cap that had the defect related to the construction method, yep. the cap to the sidewall. Was yes, that repairable? That was, no, that was not repairable because what happened is the reinforcement layers had been forced out and over um, that pipe stand leg. So when the OD of that dome head was cut to where it would match up to the OD of the shell, the laminate that had continued on down straight and could be connected to the vessel shell wasn't there for probably six inches. Um, you could have filled that in with some other laminate maybe. You could have also tried to extend the weld in that area perhaps because you'd have to get back to sound material on both sides. Um, but in the end, that part was rejected. It was agreed to be rejected and was mistakenly brought back into assembly. So, no, it was not replaced or repaired. It was replaced. It just took three visits to get it replaced. Very good. Okay, that's all of the relevant questions. Somebody wanted to know where their donuts were, but that's it for the q and I'll send uh, it back to you. Those donuts are coming via drone, Ron. Watch out your window. All right, everyone. I'd like to take a quick last minute here to give a shout out to the next Maverick webinar we have planned. Daryl McCulloch, Maverick's engineering manager, will present the next Maverick webinar in January. And it will be no doubt filled with one of the exciting and danger filled engineering lessons he's learned along the path of his career. The next Maverick webinar will take place sometime late next January, but I promise we'll inform you of the actual date once it gets firmed up. Daryl's presentation probably won't have as many pictures as mine, but please consider Daryl's feeling. Yes, he has one, and help raise his webinar attendance numbers by listening in. Honestly, his confidence could probably use a little boost during these difficult times. Well, that's it for this webinar. Thank you for taking a few minutes of your time and spending it with me. I do appreciate it. Feel free to reach out to me in the future if you have any non-metallic inspection questions. Stay safe and take care, everyone.